As the new year breaks, watch out for the fragments of silicon. <laughs> Welcome to the first proper Fragments of Silicon episode of 2020. Um, as always, we did our you know our usual return with reviews. Those are available. You can go watch them. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, you know, I'm your host, Adam. Joining me, as always, is the regular crew. Uh, let's get to the news. Let's find out how everyone's holidays went. <laughs> oh, I'm sure much fun was had. Um, anyway... Uh, Twilight, why don't you start us off this week? All right, well, my Christmas vacation was all right. Um, nothing eventful or special, but it was enjoyable to spend time with my family. Um, in, eh, in terms of when it comes to getting gifts, uh, I'm a little surprised this year by getting a Fitbit. Oh, man. There you go. Yeah, I've. I do exercise, I, well, walk regularly in the uh, afternoon, well, evenings after work. So it's not like an incentive, uh, special incentive or anything like that, but it's nice to keep track of my uh, heart rate and mm -hmm. health statistics, yeah. statistics as, uh, well, anyway, um, but yeah, it's pretty neat. And um, my cousin also sent me a, um, well, this was the fit that was for my mother, and my cousin sent me a 20 pound blanket. Oh, one of those weighted blankets? Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it's pretty neat, honestly. And I'm kind of thankful for having it since for some reason, every morning I find I somehow push the covers off my bed in my sleep. <laughs> so I was, so now I'm going to lay on top of my covers, and, and it won't happen anymore. Good luck trying to wash that thing. <laughs> Yeah, I haven't really thought about how I'm going to do that yet. <laughs> Not washing machine and dryer, I can tell you that. <laughs> They'll pray for the I'm sweet release of death. I, yeah, I don't want to break my washing machine and dryer. <laughs> no, 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 you do not. <laughs> <laughs> that can be very expensive to fix. Or get a new one. <laughs> or both. Well, I mean, are you renting your washer and dryer, or is that part of the... I came with my uh, my uh, apartment, so yeah, Impressive. yeah. I don't think uh, my landlord would appreciate me breaking them. No, I, I imagine. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, um, besides holiday stuff, um, work has been going all right. Uh, we had our first um, yesterday. We had our first. Um, um, that's the word I'm looking for. Well, anyway, our first significant snow. Yeah, that's what I'm looking for. <laughs> our first significant snow yesterday, and um, at least for this year. And, uh, eh, wasn't much of a deterrent for me to, for, getting to work, eh, for getting to work. Eh, and it was gone pretty much poof by the afternoon anyway. So, shows how much of a threat that was. Hmm. <laughs> Um, Miss NL, in terms of gaming, um, I really haven't played anything um, during the uh, vacation period. Um, yeah. um, I've been instead of focusing on my, um, um, been focusing on drawing with my uh, tablet, this digital drawing tablet I've had for about two years. So I've been meaning to practice with that thing. My drawing is a hobby of mine. Oh, man. I don't think I really mentioned that. I've been focusing on bigger drawing with the thing since I'm not, I haven't really gotten that good with that. I can draw people in general, but figure drawing is kind of a weak point for me. Um, and that's about it for me. All right. Um, Galix, why don't you uh, regale us with your holiday uh, experiences? 
Well, I had a nice long break from work because I uh, kind of forgot to use as much of my vacation time during the year as I was probably should have. Um, so that was good because there were a couple of uh, decent snowstorms that we had to clean up for. Uh, family Christmas thing went well. Uh, the big adjustment going into the new year is that my mom has also left her job. She's not quite old enough to retire, but close enough that she didn't want to bother with a new thing. And her company is just like imploding, I guess. So getting out while the getting's good. <laughs> More or less. Um, my mother's retirement was like that. So she's home, and she's the uh, home improvement slash care person. So she has a whole bunch of projects lined up, and some of them involve me cleaning up my room more or doing other things to be better about my health, which I was thinking about doing in the new year anyway, and I'm still – I need to see a doctor because I haven't in a long time and also to check on my blood pressure. Mm. Right. Uh, the place where I was planning to go, apparently, like, that entire office, no one is taking any more uh, patients, so I am have to look somewhere else. Concerning. Ugh, which is annoying, because that one is close enough that I would, like, actually go. <laughs> um, anyway. Right. Well, I, I'm, I don't do New Year's resolutions, but I'm trying to make a to-do list of some stuff to try to, you know do better at uh -huh. um video game wise mostly been playing pokemon sword and i started shield but i haven't really got very far yet because i still need to finish sword um but i want to not miss out on all the early stuff from shield mm. like all the early mystery gifts and stuff so mm. um played some shovel knight uh I'm about two thirds. So annoyingly, my Shovel Knight playthroughs are all on different things. <laughs> uh, Shovel of Hope and I think Spectre of Torment are on my 3DS. Uh, I think my abortive attempt at Plague of Shadows is on the PC. And now King of Cards is on my Switch. So <laughs> not that I mind having the game multiple times, but I wish they were all together. Um <laughs> But yeah, King of Cards uh, about two thirds of the way through, so that's been fun. Um, and yeah, we do have I do have a Switch game to review for this week that I have not started yet, but we'll probably do some of tomorrow because I have free time tomorrow, and hopefully, it looks uh, at least more you know of a game than the park was. Not that the park <laughs> is bad, but horror walking simulators are not my style of entertainment normally. Uh, yes, yes. Me. All right. Mm -hmm. um, anything else? Uh, not particularly. I don't think. All right. That means it's your turn, Petty. Oh, uh, let's see. As far as Christmas break itself, it was pretty quiet. And for Christmas presents, I got a um, PlayStation Network gift card that I used to pre-order the new Kingdom Hearts three DLC. Uh, Super Monkey Ball Banana Blitz HD also I got. Yeah. And um, I also got a smoothie maker because better than drinking, you know, soda and crap. Ah. I guess. Good call. Yeah. I, I'm honestly... I mean, it depends on what you put in the smoothie. Yeah. yeah. True, yeah. And then... Because you can totally make a root beer smoothie. <laughs> <laughs> well, this one, you can, you have to be careful putting carbonated beverages in, because it's kind of like, if you know what a magic bullet is, mm. if uh, if you spin that with nice. carbonated beverages, you can make it blow off the top. Yeah. Okay, so you have to do, a, you have to go out a little <laughs> bit for, you have to like buy root beer syrup. <laughs> <laughs> And then, as far as health stuff, I don't need to go to physical therapy anymore. And as long as I'm not having any more problems, I don't need to see the surgeon anymore. So it's kind of just like, you know, see about building strength in the leg and whatnot. Right. 
and apparently my GI doctor thinks I need to start losing weight or I need to look into bariatric surgery, which that's going to be fun. Mm. Always a thing. Yep. But I guess aside from that, not a whole lot big's been going on. Okay. So I guess next victim. Well, that'd be me. Uh, let's see. Holidays were fairly quiet. Um, you know, just kind of what it is these days. Um, mentioned this before, but, uh, you know, it's like most of uh, the family has moved out of the area. So it's just mother and I. So, you know, there's just not a big call for doing big holidays anymore, mm. whether it be Thanksgiving or uh, Christmas. So I spent my uh, Christmas having pizza. Oh, man. Mm, not the worst uh, Christmas uh, Christmas meal I've ever had, let's say. Mm-hmm. Like, very mm-hmm. good. Um, let's see. Uh, for Christmas, I got a new microwave to replace the old one, which is starting to break down. It seems to be a theme. <laughs> and things breaking down at once. Seen that before. Or... <laughs> Close, but yeah, you know, it's like thankfully the new mi- microwave is working fine. A bit less uh, powerful than the old one, which is actually fine because um, I would always forget that this thing was more powerful, and sometimes it would overcook my food. So, mm, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and the old microwave, I don't know where it put its power settings either. Like it, it didn't really list that. Uh, anyway, so that was my Christmas. Um, you know, game wise, played some random games, some <laughs> Chrono Trigger, Batman Arkham Origins Blackgate. Like, if you ever wanted to play bat- a mediocre Batman Metroidvania game, this is the game for you. Like, <laughs> mm-hmm. and a lot of Shovel Knight King of Cards. Uh, and yeah, that's. I think that's it for the news, uh, holiday edition. Mm-hmm. So. Merrily, we shall roll along to the interview portion of the broadcast. And joining us this week is John Lester of Gangster 81 and Collector Vision Games. Thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to be on here. No problem. No problem. Right. So how we like to get uh, started is we'd like to ask the people behind the games, uh, studio, whatever, um, how they got interested in video gaming, both on a personal and a professional level. Okay. And players here. I'd imagine. Anyway. So, what was the last part of that question? I didn't quite catch the last part. I imagine there's a bit more uh, layer here because you you do two sides of video gaming. Sure. You know. Anyway. So I guess the first part, to answer the first part, how I got into gaming, correct? How I got into game development, so to speak? Is that kind of the first part uh, of the question? Uh, how you got into video games, like as a hobby. How you got Oh, into- as a hobby. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So I uh, grew up, I am an 80s kid, right? So <laughs> born in 81, hence the Game Show 81 name. Um, ah. So my very first console I ever played, that I remember playing anyway, was the ColecoVision. Uh, and just to have a lot of fond memories playing that, my neighbor had an Atari 2600. And then, of course, in 85, remember my mom coming home from Price Club back in the day and bring home the NES. And I think that's kind of what's really sparked my interest in video gaming is probably when the NES came out. Not to say I didn't like video games before, but that just brought it to a whole other level, right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, of course, I grew up in the whole, you know, 90s, 16-bit war between Genesis and Super Nintendo and all that good stuff. So I uh, consider myself fortunate to have lived through all that. And, uh, yeah, I'm just obviously still in the gaming now. And, um, you know, on the professional side of the equation, how did you... Get, not only get into game development, but uh, you host a popular gaming YouTube channel. How did all of that come about? For sure. So I started that channel, Game Thirty One, back in. I gotta double check. I think it's like 2009. Mm. Uh, basically, how it got started. I, funny, interesting enough, I, I got married, uh, and one of the gifts I got as a wedding gift was a camcorder. Right. Uh, so, so uh, I, I was kind of looking online to see. I have a lot of a pretty substantial. Uh, console collection. I have over, I think, like close to 200 consoles in my collection. They're kind of unique. Some really rare ones and stuff. And there really wasn't 
any information about these consoles online at this time, right? I was a huge fan of James Angry Video Game Nerd and all that good stuff, and I was kind of trying to find some information about these consoles I own, and to be honest, there was a void. So I ended up doing some research on my own and and just started doing some uh, some cameras, you know, just talked in front of the camera and zero editing, zero experience of, uh, of how to, you know, talk in, in, in front of a camera, so to speak. And that's kind of how I got started, just kind of posting videos and people seem to enjoy it. And here I am uh, almost 11 years later, uh, still doing it. So it's been, it's been an incredible journey. I, I don't doubt it. And uh, so it's a question, uh, you know, how have things changed doing the show now versus uh, 11 years ago? Well, there's certainly a lot more people on, on YouTube than there were 11 years ago, right? So I got I got started in a good time because there weren't that many. And and so uh, because of that, I you know, people were able to find my channel more and videos more, obviously. So I guess now it's changed because there's a lot more people, which is uh, obviously a good thing. Uh, but, uh, but it just channel my channel and other channels kind of get buried with all the other content online now. Uh, so it's kind of that's how it's kind of changed. Yeah. I've also heard that um, YouTube isn't very vintage gaming friendly these days. But. Yeah, there's that too. Yeah, I mean, for sure. I mean, you got the younger millennial guys who uh, obviously are more into like Fortnite, which is fine, and modern games. Uh, so it is it is what it is. I, I've always done from day one, I have done YouTube for my sole purposes just because I have fun doing it. I don't do it for income. I, I still have my day job. I don't make enough money to, uh, to quit my day job on doing YouTube, nor would even if I did, I probably wouldn't. Uh, because I just don't think YouTube will be around forever, right? So um, I don't know. I just I just have doing have fun, and we have a great community of people on there, and I met a lot of incredible people. I've, I've I've traveled the country going to shows and met some really cool people doing it. So it's been great. No doubt, no doubt. I mean that that's probably a factor in why you can still enjoy YouTube. Uh, it's right. just a lot of the people who do it professionally seem very angry and bitter not without cause because youtube is just an <clears throat> pain but, um. yeah i mean i'd say three to four years ago maybe even longer a little bit longer than that youtube changed your algorithms right the way that people find your videos right it used to be the point where you just post a video and if you're subscribed to that channel you'll get that video in your feed now mm -hmm. youtube just kind of pushes what they want you to watch right okay. and, and so it, it gets it gets buried and if you're not in that algorithm so to speak I think to your point, if you're like a retro gamer, it can kind of be hard to to get notice. So I think starting a channel now, it's much more difficult than when I started 11 years ago. Uh, so my advice for those who are new or, or wanting to get into YouTube, do it because you have fun, engage in community, but don't do it to get rich. Don't get it. do it to get millions of views uh, because more often than not, that may not happen. Yeah, I could definitely agree with that. Um... And flipping things, um, the game development side of the equation, sure. that start. Yeah, so that started, I'd say, about 2014-ish, right? So one of the segments I had on my Game Trade 1 show was uh, a good neighbor of mine, his name's Joe, has an incredible uh, gaming inventory. He has a website. At the time, it was called Atari2600.com. He's now transitioned it to eBay. But long story short, I used to have uh, a segment with him called Retro with Joe. And on one of those segments, we talked about homebrew games, right, and mm -hmm. games in general. Uh, and and he, he kind of asked me the question. He's like, John, what would you, if you were to create a game, what would you call it? And I kind of just jokingly, I said, I was like, yeah, I'd probably call it Game Show. You won the video game. Just kind of jokingly, facetiously, just like whatever. And after that, um, after that video, he he like pulled me aside and he was serious. He was like, I want to do a ColecoVision game, and let's call it Game Show. You won the game. And let's, you know, I know that ColecoVision was your first system. Let's do it. And so we went on to Atari Age. We found a group of people. We got the game done. And through that connection, I got connected with the folks at ColecoVision Games, Toby and Jeff, and uh, became really good friends with them. I became part owner of the company. And that was, I think, I believe I joined them about 2015, so about five years ago. Uh, and at the time, our name ColecoVision Games because they, too, are very into ColecoVision it's kind of a, a spin on that name, Collector Vision, ColecoVision. Uh, we're the only company in North America that owns a ColecoVision cartridge mold, which is kind of random. Um, so, but when I joined, we actually moved into making Super Nintendo games, NES games, obviously modern games, which you're playing here, Sydney Hunter. Um, so it's been it's been great. It's been awesome. Well, that's good to hear. That's good to hear. I mean, 
I gotta admit, I'm interested in how uh, things work. Uh, you know, in terms of developing for a ColecoVision. You know, you know, we've had other homebrew developers on the program, and you know, th they do the populist stuff like you know, sure. NES, Genesis. Yeah, you, but yeah. I'm like, ColecoVision's interesting, n not just because, you know, not necessarily obscurity, because in its time frame, it was uh, a pretty sizable challenger to the Atari 2600. Sure. It's so. It's it's obviously a very niche, uh, uh, you know, market, right? Uh, it came out between the time frame of the Atari 2600 and NES, right? It came out in 80, 83. Um, so graphically, it's it's kind of equivalent to the MSX, the first MSX that came out in Japan. Yes. It's a really powerful, for when it came out, it could do a lot visually. I mean, it really, for me, I'm a huge arcade guy, right? I love, I love the Donkey Kong. I love the classic arcades and, you know, Tapper, et cetera. And for me, ColecoVision is that console to play those home home ports or those classic games, right? Mm -hmm. So, and, and then, you know, it's a really tight-knit community. Uh, people are very loyal to it. We only, when we do batches of games, we only do like 100 or so. I mean, they're very small, limited batches, right? But uh, it they're they're very loyal. The graph, the games look great. It is really incredible. Uh, and then there's been the expansion ports. You know, there's a whole, people have added expansions to the, the ColecoVision to make it even more powerful as far as uh, memory goes and what you can do with it. So it actually is almost on par now with like an NES. <laughs> it's pretty incredible. Um, so it's really cool. Uh, and the games we've come out with have been, been fun and it's it's been obviously challenging because once you, and this is true with all home brewers, if, if once you burn the game to a, to a ROM or a cart, it's there forever, right? You can't patch it. So <laughs> you actually have to make sure you play through it, make sure that there's no bugs, no issues with the game at all. Mm. Ah uh, yes, doing it old school. That, yeah, that's the bad part of the old school. Like, y you're not able to mm -hmm. fix the games. Yeah. But... Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, so did the games? I mean, there's the stealth update, but that doesn't help people who have the old version. Uh, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> anyway, um, so did the Games for eighty one game uh, retain that title, or did it get renamed something else? No, it came out. Uh, I did indie game, indie go go back in the day. Uh, released it, uh, did some limited versions of it, and it's essentially what it ended up being is I kind of took some of my favorite arcade games of the day, like Pac Man, Donkey Kong, uh, Space Invaders, and there's three stages, but the games are kind of themed in that style, but they're completely unique games in themselves. They're not like copies of the game, if that makes sense. So. I have a channel, I have a video of it buried on my channel. <laughs> so if you go to my channel on YouTube and you type in Game Show on the video game, you'll find some gameplay of it to give you kind yeah. of a, yeah, yeah. Fair enough, fair enough. And, um, um, you know, how much of the controller does it use? Uh, for the Coleco? Yeah, for the ColecoVision, because um, the ColecoVision controller is pretty infamous. It's it's awful, yeah, right. It's awful. <laughs> you can just say it, right? It's as awful. I hope you awful like control. number pads. <laughs> yeah, it's like with your phone. Like, all of, like uh, all of the, why was this a thing? Like, why were the number pad controllers a thing? I, I still don't get this. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, you know, the television did the same thing as for just options and stuff like that, right? Yeah. Uh, but the television and the Atari twenty uh, fifty two hundred did. Right, the fifty two hundred did as well. Yes, yeah, just random. That's even a worse controller than the ColecoVision, believe it or not. Yeah. The, just uh, they just break all the time, uh, but yeah, it does. It does require the ColecoVision controller, unfortunately. Um, but uh, if you can get a good good controller, it plays pretty well. Yeah, it is worth noting that uh, the ColecoVision uses the DB8 plugs, if I'm remembering correctly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you can use like the Atari 100 controller. Yeah. You can use a Commodore 64. You can use a Genesis pad. Genesis pad, right? Right. <laughs> Right. So that was the first homebrew game, I'm assuming, uh, but certainly not the last. Uh, you've, uh, with Collector Vision, have put out uh, a bevy of uh, titles here for various systems. Right. And, you know, it seems like the lead franchise is the Sydney Hunter games. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So the first Sydney Hunter game that we released was Sydney Hunter and the Shrines of Peril, I believe. And that was for the Intellivision. Uh, and one of my very favorite games uh, back in the day for the ColecoVision, it's kind of a random game. Have you guys ever played the ColecoVision? Just curious. 
I have not. I played it in television. In television, okay. How okay. different that is. My parents used to have one. So there is a platformer on the ColecoVision called Smurf Rescue at Gargamel's Castle. It I am came out. Here with okay. The game. Okay, so it came out for the ColecoVision, also came out for the Atari 2600. Never came out for the Intellivision. So what we did was we kind of reskinned it <laughs> as uh, because of copyright issues. We can't just you know use Smurf, uh, but we rebranded it as a Sydney Under game, and that came out and did really well. Uh, we also have uh, so anyway. Long story short, um, Sydney Hunter itself was created by a guy named Keith. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Keith Erickson, uh, and if you he did, I think he came out in. 2012 maybe 2013 he created a flash game it's still online you can google search it and it's essentially like an msx flash game called sydney hunter and the caverns of death and it's free you can check it out it's playable we we enjoyed this game he reached out to us we got connected with him long story short we ended up working with him and he he uh ended up selling us the the rights of sydney hunter um so you know long story short we have uh, a handful of sydney hunter games going from you know the commodore 64 to uh, the Super Nintendo, uh, obviously, to modern platforms, to ColecoVision and Television, etc. Hmm. And uh, there's what, like four overall Sydney Hunter games, or or is like every Sydney Hunter game on a platform unique to that platform? Not necessarily. So some of them are multi-platforms, right? So we have, for example, Sydney Hunter and the Caverns Death that came out for uh, Super Nintendo. It's also for the uh, ColecoVision, so it's kind of like the first game ever to be ported both consoles, which is strange. Uh, but we also have Sydney Hunter and uh, the Sacred Tribe, which has come out for the Intellivision, ColecoVision, Commodore 64, among other ones. So uh, MSX, we're just waiting for uh, the production on that, but that's complete. Um, so so kind of yes and no. Uh, so it, it, it's cool, but then it's also confusing because people are like, oh, I played Sydney Hunter, I really enjoyed it for this system. Uh, but you know they confuse like for example, Sydney Hunter, the, the Curse of the Mind, which you're playing here, uh, it's 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 only on modern platforms. So people are like, oh, I played that on the Super Nintendo. Well, that's not the case. That's a same character, yes, but it's a completely different game. So there's some confusion. Well, how do you get around that? Uh, good good question. I think it's just uh, over time you just get people to play it. I mean, obviously the games have different names, <laughs> but people people don't catch that, right? They're uh, yeah. It just it's 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 a struggle, you know, to be honest. But uh, yeah. Well, I suppose it's you know uh, availability because most of the Sydney Hunter games are on classic platforms. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, only as far as I know, Curse of the Mayan is available on you know the new stuff. Right. Uh, yeah, it's it's available on Steam. Are you playing this live, by the way? This yes. is live. Yes. Where, where, where are you uh, trying yeah. to go? <laughs> I'm just meandering around right now. Okay. Okay. Right on. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. So this is right now. It's only on Switch and Steam. However, we uh, we're gonna port it to Xbox One and PS4 uh, here probably end of first quarter soon, with a month or two. So. Um. Are you like waiting on approval for that, or is uh, uh no. No, we're just trying to. We're we're making some tweaks. I mean, it's it's built on Unity. Uh, so it does transfer over fairly well, but we just got to make some adjustments and tweaks and uh, change some of the, uh, the achievements and things like that. So we're we're almost done. Oh, that's good to hear. Yeah. Uh, any like sort of added content to the PlayStation Four or Xbox One versions of uh, uh, Curse of the Mayan here? Nothing, nothing planned to be honest at this point. Uh, that sounds about right because you know it's all. All of the major systems, you know, unless you're making a big triple A game, right, are basically the same. I mean, there's some finickiness with the Switch, I know, but yeah, you, know, you know, it's like a game like Curse of the Mind here is gonna be able to run as well on the Switch as it does on a PlayStation 4, right? And uh, focusing in on Curse of the Mind here, what was the desire to do a uh, Sydney Hunter game on modern platforms as opposed to more home stuff? Yeah, good question. So this game actually started off, I believe we started back in 2015, uh, mm -hmm. almost about right, right when I jumped on the company. And initially it was going to be an NES game. Uh, and it was titled uh, Revenge of the, uh, it was called Mayan's Revenge is what it was called, the initial game title. And it was kind of a clone of, I don't know if you ever played Montezuma's Revenge, if you remember that game or not. 
I have not played that game, but I know of it. Okay. So that was a huge uh, influence for this game. It's funny because people say, oh, yeah, your game is a lot like uh, uh, Rick Dangerous. And, you know, I've never played Rick Dangerous. I don't think any of my team has ever played Rick Dangerous. So it's kind of funny. But uh, but Montez Dreamer's Revenge is definitely an influence for, for this game. Uh, and so... So long story short, we that was on the NES. Uh, we had um, I'm drawing a blank on the programmer's name, and it should come to me. But the guy who did Battle Kid, have you ever played Battle Kid for the NES? You guys familiar with that game at all? Yeah, it's yeah. a really cool homebrew game. But he was our programmer, and he was in Japan, and it just it kept getting dragged on and dragged on, and the game just became too big for it, its own good, right? And so at that point, we we're like, let's just port this to modern platform. So we brought on Russ, the programmer. We decided to take it from uh, programming on the NES to programming in Unity. Uh, and then in doing that, we had to change the aspect ratio because the NES is 4 by 3 this is 16 by 9 So we had to redo all the maps. Uh, and so this game, it took five years to develop. And part of the reason why is because we kind of built it on the go. Like, we didn't have... Like, we came up with the title of the game before we had a story of the game, which is not the best route to do, right? So, you know, it, it eventually got to the point where, like, uh, you know, let's that's a great idea. Let's keep it for a sequel if it comes to that, if we do another one in the future, because let's just get this game done, right? So, Right. <laughs> uh, five years is a long time to be developing a lot yeah. of things. Right, right. Um. And where did Sydney Hunter come into the picture? You know, when did this game change from Mayan's Revenge to Curse of the Mayans? Yeah, so uh, again, the theme of the game, because it's kind of Montezuma Revenge, has always been like the, you know, Mayan the theme, Aztec kind of theme. Uh, and so we just kind of, we, we changed it up. We initially titled it, it's funny, we initially titled uh, Mayan's Revenge, and then we changed it to uh, Curse of the Mayans because we, we don't want to copy the you know, uh, Montezuma's Revenge title. But mm -hmm. we come to find out that Mayans is actually incorrect, right? So when you're talking about the Mayans, it's actually the Maya, right? But we didn't know that, right? So we called it, we changed it to Mayan, which mm -hmm. is still not technically correct. Uh, so when you're, you know, Mayan is uh, a language, not a culture, a person, right. people. So when you're referring to, I don't, we only came out to find this later on down the road, like, oh, it's actually the Maya. Um, so we actually poke fun. It's funny. I don't know if you noticed in the early part of the game, we, yeah. we call ourselves out on it. We're like, oh, you know, who'd be stupid enough to, you know, name a game wrong, whatever, right? As beyond me, because at that point it was like we already had our marketing done. It was already advertised as Chris and Mine. We're not, we're not going to change the title a third time, so we're like, we'll just keep it. And most well, people the game, don't notice. The game's tongue is pretty far in cheek, so it's appropriate to do that. Right, for sure. <laughs> no, no, the seashell doesn't magically let you understand us. We just don't speak English to people who don't have it. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, it's yeah. funny. Yeah. I mean, if you really want super fun, happy naming times with Mesoamerican tribes, try the Aztecs, or as they really are known, the Mexica. Right. Right. There you go. <laughs> so you know, we we kind of we added some humor in the game, as you guys notice, and and some people love it, some people hate it. It's it's one of those things that that just kind of you could rub you the right way and rub you the wrong way, and it just whatever. So <laughs> you know, we we just decided to keep it there today. So <laughs> kind of keep it unique. Yeah. Now, outside of um, expanding the aspect ratio, uh, was there anything else done to make the game more in line with modern platforms? Because I know a lot of retro games do this. Or, you yeah, know, a lot for sure. So, so, yeah, the music, you know, itself, we really try to keep the music itself kind of a chip tune 8 bit steam style game. Ooh, there you go, close. Uh, uh, but as far as the, uh, you know, the color palettes and all that, it's a little brighter than you would find on NES, right? It's uh, you, this is obviously when play on NES, you get too much colors, but we, you know, we try to keep as much as possible to the true Nintendo feel gameplay feel. In fact, this game, are you playing on the switch or is the steam you're playing this on steam steam? Okay. So for example, for the, the switch version, you can actually play it using the Nintendo switch, like old school Nintendo controller. You can use, you can actually program to play on two buttons, just like the old school controller. We did that intentionally. So it felt like you're actually playing an NES game. Yeah, we reviewed this, and uh, I don't have the NES controller, but I tried to use the Super NES controller, and I think there was a little bit of an issue with uh, it. Pretty much only does the two buttons or the the other mode. I, hmm. I forget. It okay. it wasn't a big issue. It worked. It was just a little bit okay. awkward. Yeah, those controllers came out, uh, you know, just fairly recently, right? So yeah, yeah we got. It's good to know because I don't own any of those Super Nintendo. I, I probably should check it out and. 
you know, that should be an easy fix on our end. We can just patch it. <laughs> yeah, it was a while, so I don't remember exactly yeah. what the issue was. But that's cool. I, I think it was like I couldn't. It was something about using the the uh, switching items or something, or using the special mm -hmm. items. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right well, on. Matching, uh, matching the NES is actually a bit trickier than um, understood, because, well, had um, coprocessors. You know, mm -hmm. like back in the day, you could uh, put chips on cartridges, and they would act as coprocessors. Right. Like, um, you know, the be like it, bl the best you can do on like just stock hardware is actually like Super Mario Brothers. Mm -hmm. But you know, so getting the NES feel can be trickier because you know late era. Uh, you know, you look at Kirby's Adventure versus Super Mario Brothers, and you'd be hard pressed to believe that they're on the same system right right yeah i think graphically this is more like you know you call, you'd call it 8-bit but it's more class closer to like almost 16-bit kind of a mix right mm -hmm. um yeah some some of the characters that we use like in this game uh the enemies for example are, are found in other versions of sydney hunter for example like uh, caverns of death uh that's for the super nintendo and and uh coleco vision that is, uh, there's some enemies, like the ghost enemy you see in this game is strictly taken from that game. <laughs> so if you've played both, um, and I would say as far as programming goes, the most difficult system we've ever had to program for by far has been the Super Nintendo. Uh, you, don't, you don't see many new Super Nintendo games, and there's a reason for that. There's not much tools out there to program for the Super Nintendo, whereas the Nintendo, you see a ton of you know homebrew games. That's because people have like created, you got the NES Maker for crying out loud, people can do their own now, right? Uh, so, so it's it's uh, it, it was super challenging. That game also took us close to five years to produce and release, uh, and it was just a, a headache. But at the end of the day, we're happy to get it be done with it. <laughs> I, I don't doubt that. I mean, you know, th that's a common refrain from people who have spent five or seven or eight years developing a right. game. Right. And this has happened. Yeah, you know, we, we, you know, uh, so. Now, in terms of Sydney, the how do I put the Sydney Hunter Legacy? Mm -hmm. um, you know, outside of like uh, encountering all, you know enemies that appeared in different you know previous games, like how much do you need to know of the previous homebrew Sydney Hunter games to play this one? You don't. You don't. They don't really have a continual storyline or story arc, and that's intentional. You know, I mean, there's some references I think he made to like Sacred Tribe earlier on in this game, uh, and you know, but just more of a more of a reference, but you can just jump into this game and have no knowledge of Sydney Hunter and still enjoy it, right? So there's no no continuation. You don't have to know anything back what happened before. Okay. And um, how has the game been performing since it got released? As far as sales goes and stuff, yeah, it's been it's been good, man. You know, we've we've sold games every day, which is great. Mm -hmm. You know, this is our first game for Modern Platform, so honestly, I none of us had any idea what to expect sales wise. You know, I mean, it could it could take off and be the next Untitled Goose game, <laughs> you know, and sell a million copies, you know, or it could just be under the radar, right? And I think right now, I, I think, honestly, we're kind of a little under the radar, um, which is a good and bad thing, right? So we just, people who, are, who play it enjoy it, which is great. Uh, people who've reviewed it have given it really positive uh, things, which is awesome. Yeah. Um, so right now, we're just working on getting the word out. We, we're not, we don't have any major publisher behind us to do we didn't do a kickstarter for this game we self-funded it right so it's just a matter of just going out there and and doing sales and doing contests and giveaways and being on podcasts which i appreciate this opportunity to talk about the game and you know do what we can just get the word out for the game that's that's kind of where it comes down to right now yeah, we certainly understand i mean uh, i'm not too surprised that a game like this is flying under the radar it's just you know uh we cover a lot of indie games right you know, yeah, it's like, re retro flavored platformers are like this one is good, but there are a lot of them. Yes. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it's just you know how do you stand out in a crowd kind of question. You know. Yeah, that's true. That's true. You get that one uh, one person who can play it who's got a good reach, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and and can get the word out there. That helps certainly a lot. But yeah, you know, it's sometimes it's luck of the draw. Uh, you know, we, uh, certainly, like I said, I mean, I'm not displeased by the sales by all means, but, uh, do I wish it was more? Of course. I mean, you know, I could, we could have a million copies, but I still wouldn't more, you know? So it's, uh, it, it is what it is at this point. We're just, we're, uh, just taking it every day by day. 
Fair enough, fair enough. Um, now, in terms of a physical release, mm -hmm. any plans to do any sort of uh, you know, physical Switch game? Yeah, you know, it's, I get, if I had a dollar for every time someone asked me that, which is a great question, because, you know, I, I am a physical guy myself. I, you know, we're obviously retro gamers, and, and mm -hmm. this game was designed, to be honest, to be on a physical platform, right? So, uh, of course, I mean, our goal is to have this on a physical f format. Right now, nothing's uh, firm on the date uh, as far as like how we're gonna get that done. Whether it's doing it ourselves or partnering with, you know, third-party company, someone like Limited Run or uh -huh. First Run. I mean, there's a ton now of companies that do that. So we're just, you know, uh, kind of taking it day by day. Uh, but yeah, absolutely love to do this on a physical. Huh. Not surprising. Like that's another bit of business these days. Uh, you know, the Limited Run set. And mm -hmm. it's been, like honestly, um, physical is in a better place now than it was last generation. I don't think people know this too much, but you know, true. like a game like Curse of the Mind, like if this were released on the Xbox Live Arcade, you know, for the Xbox 360, uh, chances are this probably would have never, this would never see a physical release. Right. Close to the day where there are many companies that are set up to. You know, release a game, you know, not just a game like this, but, you know, tons of indies come out on physical now. Sure. Absolutely. And they also don't have the problems of the AAA set when it comes to physical. That's right. Yeah. And yeah. for those who don't know, um, you know, not all of the game is in the game cartridges and game discs these days. Like, yeah, most games mm -hmm. have some part that needs to be downloaded. Mm -hmm. Sometimes yeah. that amount is all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, this game size-wise, this game is a very small. I mean, the game will take. Have you guys beaten this game yet, or did you guys just kind of play a little bit of it, or how far into it, or have you guys gotten? Uh, I think I only got about a quarter of the way through. <laughs> okay. Which okay. again didn't take super long, but I it was a busy week that week. Okay. So yeah. kind of what we're seeing on average, you know, it'll take about six to eight hours to beat this game. Uh, it's kind of through the first run through. We've seen people like on Steam who posted reviews that like put like 16 plus hours in this game, right? Because there's a lot of things that get all the extra stuff, right? So people get, are completionists sometimes, right? So the, yeah. certain, there, there's two endings in this game, for example. There's this happy ending, there's a sad ending, depending on what item you get. So there's definitely replayability. But having said that, the game itself is a fairly small, it's only 300 megs. It's not a huge, it doesn't take up much space on your Switch. Right. Or on and your that's system. With how long I spent, because uh, I think I spent like four or five hours. Okay. But Which, yeah. I'm a really slow completionist player, and also not great at platforming. Uh, fair enough. <laughs> what what god was the last god you fought? Do you remember? Uh, I forget the name, but I I did like three or four of them. Okay. Okay. Or three or so, four of the zones you go to. Anyway. So there's seven of those zones, and then there's like five kind of mini levels you need to do as well on top of that to get the the statues yeah yeah I, oh yeah yeah i got like what two pieces of the calendar and two statues or something okay so you're about a third away okay yeah <laughs> now um in regards to the steam version of this is uh sydney andre here available for windows only or is it on Mac it's, on, it's, it's on Mac too. Yeah. In fact, uh, we're actually about to release on the Apple Store here soon as well. So there is a Mac port and it is available now. Oh, that's good to hear. Um, in terms of other storefronts, uh, are there any plans to have this, have a GOG or uh, Epic Game Store version of Sydney Hunter? Uh, love to do both. Uh, haven't heard back from GOG. I know they're, I got an email and they're like, they're swamped right now, overloaded. So I need to follow up with them. Uh, mm -hmm. GOG, maybe. Um, you know, other. I'm, I'm a little hesitant because people can just download the games and, and share them <laughs> on GOG. There's no protection there on the back end of things. Um, so that's a little nerve wracking. But yeah, we'll see. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, I know that that's, whole, that's uh, the whole shtick of GOG. They're DRM free gaming. Right. And let me see here. Um, so. Outside of uh, the upcoming ports of uh, Curse of the Mayan, what else is Collector Vision working on in the future? Yeah, so for sure. We just released, I'd say about three months ago, uh, actually a new console. I don't know if you guys are aware of this. It's called the Collector Vision Phoenix. And essentially it's a it's a ColecoVision clone, but it's mm -hmm. FPGA. Uh, and it also has an F18 chip, which actually enhances the graphics quite a bit. So again, 
the gameplay uh, and graphics look much more like uh, uh, an NES game. Uh, you guys would appreciate this too, though. Not only did we add the the eight pin adapter for the controller, but we also added uh, included a Super Nintendo uh, controller port, so you can actually play it using a Super Nintendo controller uh, because of people's gripes on on the controller. So it's an HD uh, a ColecoVision game system, and it's called the Phoenix, and that's available on our site. Uh, also, packing game for that is Cine Hunter and uh, the Caverns of Death, and that's the only way you can get the game is if you purchase the system. Uh, so we're going to create new games for that system that will be only available through the F-18 chip, uh, which is cool. Uh, so there's that. And then we, d we just completed uh, a game for the NES called Dead Tomb, which is a, a point-and-click kind of uh, almost like uh, Stargate with an, a futuristic Egyptian backdrop to it. Uh, there aren't many point-and-click games on the NES. <laughs> and this yeah, one's... It, it's ahead. hard. It, it's hard to do point-and-click with the NES's level of... Sure. Controller accuracy yeah. and mm -hmm. number of buttons. So I know the, it's not impossible. It's just it's harder than it is on like Super Nintendo or right. more importantly, things with analog control. Right, for sure. So the backstory on how this game got developed was my, my two business partners are French Canadian and up in the uh, Quebec area, Montreal. And so long story short, there was a system back in the eighties uh, that almost worked very similar to like the Sega Channel where it was through the cable provider and people could actually download games through their cable box and play these games, right? Uh, and so it was only available in like the French Canadian part of Canada. And there was one particular game, I forget the name of it, uh, that was super popular in that area. And and it once, it, once that system died, it was unavailable and never saw the light of day. This game is a recreation of that game. So I know like for those who are listening, who are maybe living in France that, part of Canada, they probably know what I'm exactly what I'm talking about, but uh, it's a really fun game. It's very unique. It's, you know, I could, I could plead it in less than 10 minutes because I know where all the items are, right? It's one of those type of games, but if you, it's one of those adventure games, you have to search for certain things and kind of, and it's a, it's kind of a strategic game. And so there, there's definitely some meat to it. It's not just like a really quick game, but if you know where you're going, you could definitely speed through it really quick. But if you don't know where you're going, it could take you several hours or more to beat. So it's one of those kind of interesting games. Mm. And how how hard is this uh, graphical adventure game going to be? Like, is it going to be, uh, murder you every screen? No, no. Actually, it's funny. There's no enemies in the game. I know it sounds weird, but to say, but there are really no enemies in the game. It's the only way you would die is by doing the wrong choice. Mm. If that makes sense, right? So it's. I know. So it kind how of many, sounds... So how many? So how many killing choices are there? Are, are there per screen? Like two or five or ten or just like occasional because no, i I'd, I'd say that yeah. but like some sierra games it feels right. like that on any given screen there are like four or five things that if you say the wrong thing to you'll just freaking die <laughs> right so it's no it's not it's not brutal it's not brutal certainly not brutal but if i can get through it i think anyone can to be honest with you uh and i when i first played it i didn't have any tips and i was able to get through it fine so it's i know me the way I'm explaining it may sound a little lame, like, oh, it's a really short game and there's no enemies, but actually, graphically, it looks great, the music's great, and it's a really fun, unique game for a classic console that's not many on that particular genre of, you know, on the console, right? So, um, it's cool. It's just, you can go to our website, it's called Dead Tomb, um, and it's a really fun game. It, it should be out here in the coming months. Right. And outside of that, like, are you still doing homebrew for classic systems? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we just came out, uh, just announced our two new ColecoVision games. Uh, let me go to our website. <laughs> Double check. Live research. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, no, we just uh, we just announced our two new, um, I don't know how you pronounce it. It's a, it's a French game. It's La Abbe de Mortis, Mortis or whatever. It's Death of whatever, but... It's a platformer for the ColecoVision that just came out. Uh, there's another game that we just came out with called Soro City for the ColecoVision game, which is kind of based on the classic uh, arcade game that never was ported to uh, the ColecoVision. So that's now available as well. Hmm. And um, anything for the modern set of systems? You know, nothing quite yet. Uh, we want to get this under our belt with Sydney Hunter and the Crystal Mine. Obviously, we don't want to bite off more than we don't want to do another five year <laughs> endeavor necessarily. So, I think we've really learned a lot from working on this game. So, we do have a, a kind of a 16 bit 
game storyboard that we're working on that we've kind of got some graphics in the line but with that next game we're going to definitely put all our ducks in a row so to speak right and get everything set all the, all the levels set all the graphics all the assets set and then we're going to build it opposed to doing it on the fly like we do with this game <laughs> uh there is no better teacher than experience this is true right and let's see i guess um i'll end by asking oh what uh what conventions, if any, are you going to be appearing at? So, good, yeah, good question. So I uh, will be at, there's a show called the SoCal Retro Gaming Expo, which is in Southern California. That's the end of March. I hope to be there. Hence the name. What's that? So it's in Southern California, hence the name. Hence the name, yeah, hence the name. <laughs> uh, and let's see what else. I, I hope to be at uh, PAX East this year. I'm kind of waiting here back. Uh, from them, we were there last year and had a great time. So hopefully we'll be there. Uh, I will be at uh, probably most likely, well, for sure, the show I run in Phoenix called The Game on Expo. <laughs> I've been doing that for five years. So we'll definitely have a presence there. That's in August. Uh, the week after that is Portland Retro Gaming Expo. Hope to uh, to be there, which is another great show. Um, so I think that's going to be the key, right, is going out and, and doing these events and having people the opportunity to actually play, get their hands on the game, check it out, all that good stuff. Okay. Um, I'll see if my colleagues here have any final questions for you. I think all might have been answered. Mine yeah, have been I answered. I think I'm good. It was good to talk with you, and yeah, I enjoyed playing the game a lot. So that's great. No, good that's to talk a... to the people, person who you know. Well, like I said, I that's great. I mean, that means a lot. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to to speak in front of your audience and, and kind of let people know about the game because every all that little helps, right? Um, right? So I definitely appreciate that. Uh, I'm although, really glad. Although, yeah, go ahead. Although I do have to say, when I was looking at the other games in the series, you have assembled a very impressively difficult uh, array of uh, other consoles you need to own to be able to play <laughs> all of them. <laughs> they are very niche, right? Yeah, Commodore 64, Intellivision, ColecoVision, you're ever kind of nutty when it comes to that kind of stuff. And uh -huh. you know, it really, it's, those are very limited runs as far as games go, right? Because not, you know, they're, you know, 30 year old systems, right? So right. this is kind of our flagship game i guess you could say that right uh as far as any hundred christian mayan um you know so uh, i think like i said every day we're selling copies which i'm very appreciative of and anytime people give it a shot uh it means a lot so i think people are enjoying it for the most part which is great all right um john it was wonderful having you on the program um maybe we'll have you back on uh you know whenever um you know other projects uh, need to be discussed or for sure or maybe more on your channel, if you, you know, it's like at some point in the future. Anyway, um, the game is Sydney Hunter and, Curse of the, and the Curse of the Mayan. Uh, it is available on the Nintendo Switch and uh, Steam. And uh, there are ports in the works for the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One. And the game currently clocks in at $9.99 USD. Uh, Petty, play us for the next segment. <laughs> Since it's the first show of the new year, that means um, top, not 10 lists. It, it is a 10 list, but it is our top five, bottom five games of last year. And keep in mind, when we say um, games, we mean the games we reviewed, not mm -hmm. necessarily played, you know, or else like Bloodstained yeah. uh, would have appeared on my list, for example. You know, and also keep in mind, since most of the stuff we review is fairly obscure and relative to other programs, it's not going to look like other lists. Like, you're not going to see Resident Evil 2 on this list either. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah, I think I actually did not end up looking at the list of exactly everything that we played exactly over the past year. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so this past year, we ended up reviewing about 130 games. Yeah. Um, which is, I think, a new record for our show. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of this has to do with the fact that you know we individualize reviews a, a lot more now than we used to. Uh, yeah, and yeah. Um, so, do we want to start with the best or the worst? Um, that is a good question. <laughs> uh, 
Um, I guess we'll start with the best. Um, um, and I'll go first. Um, you know, I'll deliver my top five. Not everyone here might have a top five because, once again, um, you know, we review different things. I tend to review the most stuff because, you know, I get the most codes, yada, yada, yada. But I'm like, um, my fifth best game of the year that I reviewed was One Finger Death Punch 2. Um, if you don't know what this is, uh, it's how do, uh, it's like, um, it's an auto scroller for the new generation mm -hmm. or a, like a, a belt scroller think like the old Kung Fu game on the NES. Yeah. Or like a rhythm game. Yeah. Um, something like that. And, you know, as, as the title might, it is a sequel um, it is a sequel that is improved upon its predecessor in like every way possible. Even the developers, when we had them on the program, said that this game made the old one obsolete. Um, I'm not sure how well this game did because, uh, you know, they were really nervous. And, you know, <clears throat> we talk about this a lot, but, uh, you know, a lot of games don't make it these days mm -hmm. just because there are so many games. Mm -hmm. But. Um, yeah, um, I really, really enjoyed this game, like far more than I was expecting. And the production values were really impressive. That's kind of where the five years went. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it's like, and if, you know, these are just going to be like capsule, um, reviews or impressions or, you know, recollections really, because, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, I'll be honest, I usually don't touch a game after I'm done with it for review. Mm -hmm. Just because, you know, the fucking belt line is pretty endless. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, you mm -hmm. know, once you're, you know, you know, it takes a really special game to, for me to keep playing or whatever. That's just the nature of the beast. Like I said, we reviewed 130 games last year. You know, that, that you know, even the small games do take up a, a modicum of time. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, yeah, that was my number five. Number four, Blood Fresh Supply. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Blood, uh, what you know, is a classic '90s FPS that's actually from the '90s. Uh, none of that Dusk of Medieval uh, tribute stuff here. Um, Night Dive Studios has brought it into the modern era. Thank God. Yeah, that DOS box version made me want yeah. to go bash my head against a wall. Uh huh. Yeah, and <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, Blood came out in a time when uh, FPS controls really weren't standardized. <laughs> you know, indeed. And, and, you know, look, it took uh, them a while to get their head around the idea of like camera work. <laughs> Not so much camera work; it's more mouse strafing. <laughs> well, no, it's more the um, solidification of wads. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. You know, that's more what what was still being formulated in the late nineties. By nineteen ninety eight, you would have at least mouse look. Mm -hmm. You know, but you know, I don't think it was really until Half Life really established what a FPS should, you know, really um, control like that. You know, that just got copied over and over again. Because, you know, when you get down to it, they, the FPS controls of Half-Life are really simple compared to a lot of its contemporaries. Anyway, um, mm -hmm. you know, Blood brought, you know, not only the controls, but it brought the fucking netcode to the modern era. So you can actually play the thing without, you know, dealing with a triple migraine. Uh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, try, uh, you know... Uh, to play the original version, you had to set up TCP IP, the old school stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't want to be doing that. No. <laughs> like, oh, geez. But yeah, um, great game. Glad to see it's um, available. You know, uh, I'm looking forward to see um, Night Dive bringing Doom 64 to the masses this year. We'll see if we can have them on the program, but, you know, this is Bethesda's title, so I mean, there are usually restrictions. Like, um, for example, 
I have not mentioned this before, but Blood Fresh Supply, um, we could not do an interview with Night Dive on this game until Atari gave the okay, and they were not okay until the game got released. You know, these are the behind the scene things we have to deal with to get people on the show. Mm-hmm. You know, if they get onto the show at all. Uh, let's see. Uh, number three, Helheim. Uh, this is, if you recall, a, a 2D platform, not a platformer, a 2D side-scrolling game that, uh, does the survival crafting thing. And since it's one of those, instead of one of those fucking meandering, endlessly in early access 3D, you know, you're lost in the forest affairs, you know, you know this game. Um, Mm -hmm. it's like, you know, this game was actually fun to play. And I enjoyed it. It still has some of the frustrations of the genre, like, oh boy, I need that one fucking ingredient to advance, and I just can't get it. But uh, outside of that, r- um, rather enjoyed it. Um, let's see. Number two, Blazing Chrome. Mm-hmm. Mm. Um. Yeah, uh, Blazing Chrome. Yeah, there's a lot of retro, retro esque uh, games this year. Um, just we played a lot of those, mm-hmm. and a lot of them are really good. You know, I mean, my number six, if we were doing it, were, would be Monster Boy and the Cursed Kingdom. Mm-hmm. You know that. Um, but Blazing Chrome, this was uh, the ode to Contra. A better um, Contra game than Konami put out. <clears throat> <laughs> oh God! Let's ju- let's just put it this way: a contra game where your gun doesn't overheat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that um was a thing that Konami did. But yeah, <laughs> Blazing Chrome. This is keeping it old school. Um, if you enjoyed the 16-bit contra games, specifically contra hardcore, uh, play this one. Um. Uh, you know, it's like it's another retro game that really tries to fit into the parameters of like, you know, if we made this t- for a Sega Genesis, um, you know, it's fast as hell. It's, you know, as difficult as you would expect. You know, it's a really, really perfect ode to, you know, the co- the good contras of yore. Mm-hmm. It's like, and my number one pick would be Heaven's Vault. Uh, you know, I know a contrast to what else is here, but, you know, Heaven's Vault was an experience. <laughs> um, Heaven's Vault is a, you know, it's kind of like the new breed of adventure game. Like, this, this is something that's legitimately bringing, you know, interactive fiction, adventure games, walking simulators, you know, all of this narrative-driven gaming content forward. Um um, Heaven's Vault is not a point-and-click adventure game, necessarily, because um, it's really played with a controller. Uh, it's simulating what it's like to be an, uh, to be an archaeologist, like, and um, being a linguist, because you're doing a lot of transliteration of an ancient language, an ancient script into, you know, basically English. Uh, and you know, among that, it's a very, you know, it's a very expansive, it's a very um, replayable game. There's a lot of choices that um, you can make that, um, you know, will affect the story in different ways. Um, just an absolute masterpiece of a game that came out last year. And I'll turn it over to the colleagues, see, you know, what other games made it on our list that I haven't talked about. Um, yeah, Petty, you go first. I definitely enjoyed Dusk and um, Blazing Chrome. Mm-hmm. Mean Blood. Dusk was la- uh, was 2018. Yeah, right. Yeah, Blood was pretty good. Um, what else was there? Well, I mean, there's a list. Yep. Yeah, where is that? Uh, it's in the... 
here. I got it open. I'll post a yep. link. Sorry. It, it's fine. Copy. Uh, 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 huh. Too many windows. Sorry. <laughs> Not that I haven't been thinking about it. Just mm -hmm. um, there I are kind a lot of games I forget. Yeah, I kind of liked the um, what was it? Super Fancy Pants Adventure. Mm. But of course, Sonic fan, I like momentum-based platformers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and trying, I'm looking over the list. The thing about last year is there wasn't a whole lot that jumped out. Like I'd want to play again. Like there were some good games, but not like stuff I'd set time out to go play again or something like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's once again, it you know, that's just the kind of game we review a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, well, if you can't think of anything else, um, I'll hand it over to Gollix. Well, I think a lot of the games that uh, you mentioned that you didn't actually review, I did. Right. <laughs> If it wasn't a game, I, it was usually the Switch games. Yeah. Well, Bloodstained, we were, did we not review Bloodstained? I forgot. No, no, no. No, we talked about it in the topic of discussion. That's what that one was, yeah. Well, I mean, that would have been one of them. Yeah, we reviewed Curse of the Moon in 2018, but... Yeah. We did mm -hmm. no. Anyway. Uh, Monster, Monster Boy and the Cursed Kingdom definitely goes up there for me. Right. Mm. I mean, since I didn't talk about that one, you can talk about that one. Um, I mean, I'm actually fairly new to the whole, to the franchise in general. Uh, I, I do not have as much of a grounding, but uh, having played the, uh, the remake of uh, The Dragon's Trap, right? Uh, it is a good follow-up in the spirit of that. And again, it's kind of a disservice to like to call things it's it's a it's basically like i like metroidvania games and this was basically a metroidvania franchise before that was a thing so right or at least much of a thing and yeah so i i really enjoyed that uh having different forms to use to solve different problems is is always an interesting way to go about things so yeah i like that a lot um let's see Uh, I think I might actually pick out uh, Warlock's Tower, I remember. It was at least memorable and clever in terms of how the puzzles worked in that one. That's the one where uh -huh. you have to solve things in a number of steps, basically. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of uh, cute and clever about the way that it went about that. Um, and yeah, I'm actually going to put in Curse of the Mayan because uh, partially because I'm being reminded of it recently, but you know, it was legitimately a good game. Right. <laughs> and it helps we're doing you know, every episode, so if you want to know more, just rewind. Yeah. <laughs> Alright, um, anything else that grabs your uh, brain space? Um, oh. Treasure Stack was also a pretty nifty one. Yeah, yeah, Treasure Stack, um, uh, uh, that was a really good uh, falling blocks puzzle game. Mm -hmm. um, you don't get too many of them these days. Um, yeah. The other one we reviewed was god awful. Yeah, and jelly blocks. Fact, yeah, I'm like not gonna be lie. That's number five on my worst list. <laughs> Understandable. Like, but more on that when we get to the worst. Mm -hmm. um, I'm surprised, uh, Petty, you didn't pick Puyo Puyo Champions. I'm actually not that big a Puyo Puyo fan. I was more in the Tetris side of things. Fair enough. I mean, yeah, we did have a few PlayStation 4 reviews. Mm -hmm. Not as many as I would have hoped, but, you know, Petty Fan was laid out for a good deal of time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, mm -hmm. yeah, that's... Um... Let me see. Um, what about you, Twilight? Anything from this list that we haven't talked about yet? Uh, well, for my number five, I want to pick for a I'm gonna pick a Anodyne too. 
Right. And a dining yeah, table. I, yeah, I really enjoy this PlayStation 1 adventure graphics and the whole exploring a, a strange world. Yeah. And I thought it was uh, jumping into um, some of the uh, characters, uh, mental scapes or something like that, or something like that. kind of reminded me of um, Mega Man Battle Network in a way, and some of those segments were fun because of that. Yeah. yeah. Anodyne 2 would, would have been number seven or so. I mm-hmm. Definitely one of the best I played last year. Probably the most unique, even more so than Heaven's Vault. Like, there is not another game out there like Anodyne 2. Indeed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and Heaven's Vault, you said Heaven's Vault, but that was also on my list for, like, interesting concepts. Right. Heaven's Vault was number, would have been number six for me. Yeah. Um, anyway. Uh, let's, let's see. Oh, for number four, uh, this is one I reviewed. It was uh, Death Crown. Death Crown, yes. Mm. Yeah, the, uh, I like the... Um, it was a RTS um, um, no, well, I want to say um, it would be kind of like player versus yeah anyway you've <sighs> off my train thought there anyway um, the reason I liked it very, I'm not the biggest fan of RTSs but I did like the um, eeriness that was throughout the entire game's atmosphere its graphical style was like one bit black and white. Um, right. Kind of this creepy feeling throughout the entire thing. Um, of course, you're just playing as death and he was hell bent on destroying a king's entire kingdom. <laughs> as death um, would do. <laughs> mm hmm. Yeah, and uh, the RTS part was actually really fun. They got frustrating at times. But I liked it overall and. The game was supposed to be getting more of expansion on it so over time. I've played it since then to try this new modes out and all that. Mm-hmm. I might get to that at some point. Um, now for number three, uh, the seventh guest 25th anniversary edition. Yeah. yeah. Um, when I was a kid, <laughs> but didn't get a chance to until this year. Well, this past year. I um, I liked uh, exploring this strange house. It was about as fun as I expected it to be. Um, actually, uh, I was afraid I probably wouldn't like it as much as I would have back when it was first released. But yeah, yeah it was a good thing I probably didn't play it <laughs> back in its time. But yeah, I liked to uh, explore the strange house and. As hammy as some of the acting was <laughs> in that game, um, I enjoyed it. And, uh, right. Yeah. I, if you probably know, I probably have an odd enjoyment for horror type games. <laughs> uh, let's see now. For number two, uh, Winds of Change. Hmm. Yeah. That was the, the that was one of the various uh, graphical uh, visual novels that we did. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Um, I and that was reason, the only one that wasn't done by Manga Gamer. It was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, the reason I liked it so much, I liked its art style. Um, to some degree, I do like uh, anthropomorphic animal art. So that might just be it for me. Um, it's the night. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, no, it's just, it was a, one of the more enjoyable visual novels. Um, uh-huh. Yeah, um, I think the best visual novel I played last year was Kindred Spirits on the Roof. Like, but th- this would have been number two on in terms of visual novels. Uh-huh. Yeah. That would have been number two for me as well. I have a hard time judging visual novels as games. <laughs> it's just it's it's like a completely different category to me usually. I get that. Yeah, I can understand that. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Bit, if the other thing I liked about Winds of Change, I liked the branching stories and how I got into multiple characters. Well, even though I could, one could say that kind of held it back in to some regard. 
Mm-hmm. But yeah. Um, now that's for um, number one. This was your number two, Adam. It was a uh, Blazing Chrome. I I'm a sucker for 2D shooters. Yeah. As, a, mm-hmm. as I probably already mentioned plenty of times before, I'm a big Mega Man fan, so it kind of you know, reminded me of playing the you know, more classic style Mega Man games. Right. And then, yeah. Also, I always um, enjoyed um, Contra as well. So, mm-hmm. yeah. I don't right. want to echo much more of what you already said, so that's it for me. Yeah. Right. So, any other games you want to list on the best list? Um, It's not really a best, but another interesting one was Future Grind. I was not too hot on that game, uh, I'll be honest, but it was interesting. Then. Yeah. It's more of a curiosity type thing than you know, best uh, game. I mean, uh, along Curio lines, you know, one of the most interesting was Crayola Scoop. Yeah, that was a that was a game we had. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you know, a, a Tony Hawk's Pro Skater clone where you play play, play some sort of wax homunculus. <laughs> you still haven't figured out what the hell you are in that thing. <laughs> um, I think it's better that we don't find out. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> yeah. Probably. Well, anyway, um, so let's move over to the worst. Um, no shortage of uh, the, you know, bad games we played last uh, mm-hmm. last year either. You know, um, as I mentioned, my number five is Jelly Blocks, um, <laughs> primarily because this was an interesting concept ruined by its execution. Mm-hmm. Uh, as opposed to yeah. other entries on the system that are that were done in by like bad control. Yeah, this is the one where it's like literally Tetris, but the blocks are jelly and jiggly, and it's and it's kind of physics based. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, like it, it was an interesting, unique concept. It just awful, awful execution. Yeah, you know, the, yeah, the, the, whole the jelly... blocks, it, the physics were too loose. Mm-hmm. It was a little. It's just too difficult to actually get things to match up. You know. Mm-hmm. And you know, that's why this uh, this one's a for examples. Just because you had a good concept here, but you ruined it by your execution. You know? um, unfortunate, but it happens. Uh, let's see, uh, number four, uh, the inner friend. This is another one I, that I really didn't want to put on the, this list because once again. Maybe not so much an interesting concept, but, um, you know, it was a nifty conceit, you know, very narratively driven, you know, you know, horror ish uh, experience. Yeah. You know, um, I'll just go ahead and jump in here. That was my number four as well. Yeah. Inner friend. Oh, oh. And I like the horror aspect of it. Yeah. yeah. Just done in by its controls. Like, yeah. Just some of the worst controls I've played this year. Not the worst. That's coming up, but, <laughs> you know, but this would be number two with a bullet, let's say. Uh, yeah. Once again, it, it's not just that this was a bad game or, any, you know, it was a potentially really good game done in by its um, just terrible controls. Mm hmm. Jeez. Uh, Let's see, number three, Resno Racer. Oh, um, God, I blocked that one out. <laughs> now, I'm here to remind you, because you know, once it. again... Actually, I guess uh, Inner Friend would be number three with a bullet, because Resno's Racer's... One, you know, this is a common theme with me. Awful fucking controls <laughs> um, are just among the worst game experiences. Um, and it's not something you can really quantify it a lot of the time until you actually play it. But, you know, Resin Eraser is definitely among the set. Um, this was the kart racer we reviewed this Yeah, time. The, the one that desperately needed a power slide. Yeah, it's like, I do not know how that happened, but <laughs> this is a good example of why a, the power slide mechanic exists in kart racers. Mm-hmm. Because, ooh, just the handling was shit. It felt like I was racing on glass. Yep, yep. I'm like... 
And I wanted to, you know, once again, I wanted to like Resident Racer because not only was it a kart racing game on the PC, which is a rare beast, but this is a game that was, you know, doing unique characters. Generic, yes, but, you know, this isn't, you know, Ant Racer or Shrek Racer. And by the way, those are real kart racers, mm-hmm. by the way. The yeah, Disney well, kart Shrek, racer. I get Shrek at least has enough different characters to make a kart racer, but the characters in Ants are pretty much all fucking ants. Don't ask me. <laughs> like, I'm not, you know, I'm not the w- one who said, yeah, let's make a city kart racer out of that. <laughs> I'm like, I'm as perplexed as you are. Hmm. You know, like I said, I could go on like Eminem kart racer. You know. Yeah, the, the Wii is just populated with this kind of shit. Mm-hmm. And that's basically what this reminded me of. A budget Wii title that somehow escaped that and ended up on modern day PCs. Budget Wii and or a um, mobile title. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see, number two, if you paid attention to our recent reviews, you knew this was coming. The Pit Infinity. Oh, God. Like, yeah. I'm like, uh... This was, a, 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 you know, another game done in by bad fucking controls. It, it's like, you know, and this one is especially inexplicable to me because, you know, we've been doing FPS games on the PC for fucking ages. It's where the genre was birthed. I'm like, why am I di- still dealing with shitty mouse look? You know, in this case, I, I'm not sure if it was a mouse acceleration issue. Uh, you know, it's like the tool need to be tweaked i wasn't going to be editing any like config or any files to do that i don't have the fucking time or patience and you know just this game in general was at best average in terms of as a game but uh <laughs> you know if you recall the review this game was done in by really really spazzy um twitchy overly so controls you know that can work in some fps's this is not that kind of fps well, and you know, some of those are a dead giveaway of it wanting you to play with a, a controller. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, and no, no, I'm not playing it. I, uh, I'm not playing with a controller if I can play with a mouse and keyboard. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. I'm like, th- those are these are objectively better controls than the FPS. Indeed. Mm. And um, my number one worst game of last year. Um, Rooms of Pandora. Oh, god damn it. <laughs> That's my number two. <laughs> uh, it's like, just like, just because this one gave me the most unique problem, I, you know, I hope I never encounter it ever again. Uh, just, you know, if you missed out on the review, uh, Rooms of Pandora is kind of a puzzle game. Uh, you know, it's like, it, it's quite literal. You're in these dark rooms and you you're trying to figure out how to um get you know like open the door and uh, get through the various rooms of pandora and we all got stopped dead on our tracks when they included a qr code in one of the dun- in one of the rooms mm-hmm. i'm like not the first game to do this um fez did a puzzle that had a qr code scanner thing um, never got up to that point, but I hope it worked out better than this game because tried, 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 and tried, and tried, and tried for days upon days, and, and nothing, n- no QR code scanner worked. You know, I tried phone, I tried uh, PC, I tried, you know, game, video. You know, we had other people try, and none of us got past this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know it, it's like and you you know there might have been an alternate route in another room that uh went somewhere else but you know in terms of like the main path the first path you'd be expected to go through got literally stopped dead in the tracks not because the puzzle was too clever but because technology fucking failed mm-hmm. and the randomizer was such you couldn't just walk use a walk through you had to be able to do this. Like, it should have worked, but, like... And I checked other QR codes as well. Like, they worked. You know? Huh. Just, you know, 
awful implementation of technology that, you know, uh, literally rendered a game unplayable. Mm-hmm. Like I said, I hope I never see this particular problem ever again. I mean, shit like bad controls, bad execution, bad d- design, you know, all of that I'm going to see again. Yeah. You know, it's I expect to never see again. This is a very unique beast. Mm-hmm. All right. So, um, over to the table over here. Um, Twilight, what were your worst games? My worst? Well, um, uh, for number five, I don't necessarily dislike this one, but I had to go, I had to fill a spot in somewhere um, with something. So, if the Institute would be number five. Yeah, that is the uh, the Bomberman type game. Mm-hmm. I remember that would have been. Oh uh, my... yeah, the, with levels of jank unseen by man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So one that wanted to be Bomberman, but it it yeah. fell short. <laughs> short is an uh, understatement. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I already mentioned it during Adam's segment. Um, the inner friend for the same reasons. So I'm not going to echo anything really here. Uh-huh. Um, number three, Red Solstice. Mm. Yeah, I was not particularly fond of that game um, because yeah. of how easily you could get overwhelmed. <laughs> yeah, I think that was you, you're, you alone. It was? Possibly. I don't I don't have any memories of that one. Yeah. Um, uh. Just yeah, I, seem, I seem to remember you played it as well. It's possible I played it, but here's the thing. A lot of these games I've also forgotten anything about. Yeah, <laughs> that's understandable. I did struggle with some of these here as well, in remembering and yeah. looking I mean, for a bit. It's just what happens when you review 130 games in a year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, it's now, number two, it was Room of Pandora, I'd already said as well. Yeah, same reason. The QR code. I don't know. Hang around on that one. And number one, we didn't really. We kind of sort of reviewed this one, but honestly, it was, it was objectively the worst one. It was Super Elite Version Two Remastered. The, the what now? Super Elite V Two oh. Version Sniper two. Elite. Sni- Sniper Elite. Why they put Super Four? Wait, Just, Sniper, yeah, Elite. Sniper Elite. Yeah. I wrote that down wrong. Uh, One of those yeah. S words. Yeah, Sniper Elite P2 Remastered. Mm-hmm, yeah. Just That's because a... it was objectively bad. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. I would have, like, this would have made my top ten list more because it was a remaster that really didn't need to happen, at least not on mm-hmm. the PC. Like, I got why, you know, you might want to do it for the modern systems because, you know, modern systems might not have the game like the Switch, but, you know, the PC had a perfectly good version of this. You know, I, I suppose it helped that the, the DLC was included, but, yeah, this this was not a good version of this game. I, I don't know about, like, say, Sniper Elite 3. Anyway, um, Petty, over to you. I guess my number five would be the Ugasaba. Oh, Ugasaba. Mm-hmm. It, it wasn't as much bad as boring. Mm-hmm. And then... What was the other ones? Um, Probably Glider's Journey. That's more motion sickness type deal. Right. Which is still an asshole, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tempt me to give you another one of them. <laughs> <laughs> um... Uh, River Legends is also one of those. Mm, fishing game? Yeah. <laughs> and I guess my number two would be Ritual Crown of Horns. Yeah. It had so much potential and then it just fell on its ass. <laughs> <sighs> Always vexing. Mm-hmm. And as far as a number one, who oh boy. 
There's someone to choose from. <laughs> there is. Mm-hmm. Um, I know the lady I wasn't too fond of. Um, what was that other one? Jelly Blocks I also wasn't very fond of. Right. Jack and Jill. Eh. And yeah, Iffy, it's, Iffy Institute was kind of terrible. Artillery mm-hmm. Globe didn't seem to work right. Yep. Oh, I forgot about that one. <laughs> I, did. I did not. I wish I did. Just, uh... <laughs> And um, oh, I guess another overall terrible one was the Azura RP online. Oh yeah, God. Oh, yeah. <laughs> one that honestly should get copyright yep. infringement saying on it. <laughs> Can we legally yeah. review this? <laughs> uh, and let's see. Yeah, OMG Zombies was also... That might actually be my least favorite one because... Huh. It was just kind of janky. Mm. And like, I just kind of just rubbed me the wrong way. Uh, I kind of enjoyed that one. Like, it wasn't amazing or anything, but compared to... The other shit I had to play this year, mm-hmm. not even top ten material. Fair enough. Anyway, um, over to uh, Galix. <laughs> well, I got a lot of different games from you guys uh, right. on account of the Switch stuff. Uh, I don't. It's hard to pick a worst out of those. A lot of them were just like mediocre, on a little on the worst side of that. Yeah. Uh, and, and and further beyond that, some of them are games that I don't actually know if they're, like, actually bad or if they're just not my thing. So, like, I'm not going to ping Monster Jam Steel Titans lower than, like, fifth worst just because I don't fucking get it. Um, <laughs> Morphe's Law was really super jank for what it was trying to be. It requires a lot of precision to try to actually, like, shoot body parts to grow your body parts. And just a lot of not much came out of that, I think. Uh, It might be better with keyboard and mouse, but that's not the version we had. (laughs) Uh, I did play Iffy Institute. Iffy Institute is also on my list. (laughs) Uh, Because, I mean, I like Bomberman stuff, and that was just not a good Bomberman. Uh, I didn't. I didn't dislike Uagi Saba. I really disliked it by the time we did the review, but I kept playing it a little bit longer, and I actually started liking it a little bit. So that was weird, I guess. Um, where is it? I had it earlier. Sorry, I'm just going through the list again. Um, I, I have a hard time with the worst things anyway. I usually just try mm-hmm. to move past the bad games. No. Uh, <laughs> oh, Tetsumo Party was super disappointing mm. because it didn't have more modes. I remember mm. like the, the idea of it was kind of neat, I guess. Like sumo wrestlers doing the fucking hole in the wall challenge thing, but mm-hmm. you don't. They just you do not have enough control over what you're trying to do. That there's not really a whole lot of different stuff that you can do in that game. Um, and uh, let's put skee ball on the list for sake of being skee ball. <laughs> even, even though it wasn't bad ski ball, just just it, it inherits the sins of its ancestors of. Yeah. <laughs> Revenge. 
<laughs> I'm pretty sure revenge would be setting a ski ball table on fire. No, revenge would be actually getting it, like having a ski ball table and actually picking up some balls and walking up the table and just putting them in the fucking holes. <laughs> uh, trauma. <laughs> anyway, yeah, that's about all I got. Honestly, most like most of the rattle like a stuff was definitely not like good, but didn't stand out enough to be bad. Yeah, no. yeah. I mean, we got a few of those on the PC as well, like Mecha Bolt. Just I remember that being supremely average. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, honestly, the most interesting stuff from Radalika was the stuff that they ported. Like, um, I did go back and buy Paradox Soul and Sagebrush, mm -hmm. and those were actually, you know, um, maybe not super interesting, super interesting, but more interesting than their um, bland platformers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, they weren't all platformers even. Some of them were bland other things, but they were um, almost all of them were quite bland. Yeah. Like, like uh, Rattalaika did... The I guess I'll even make an exception for that for, uh, what's it the, the fish, the fishing... Oh, the Legend of the Fishing... Um, I, uh, I'm not looking at the right list here. Night fish? Yeah, that's the one. Okay. Uh, let me make sure I have the name right. Uh, yeah, Legend of the Skyfish, which was still kind of limited, but like had an interesting take on a Zelda-like, even if it was much more room by room. But with, like with the like grappling, fishing hook and sh and stuff, that was actually pretty interesting. So I will mostly exclude that from the wow. That was really kind of boring. <laughs> Fair enough. And, yeah, I think that'll about do it for the best and the worst. I mean, we could go on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's actually plenty of games, both good and bad, we haven't mentioned. But, you know. Um, we also have to sleep to... sometime tonight. <laughs> yeah. You know, this episode's running a bit long, but mm, it's our first episode back from the holidays. So I figured it would take a bit more, you know, getting a holiday talk out of the way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so, yeah, that is our best and the worst. All of our reviews proper are in the archives, both here on Twitch and YouTube. You know, and if you're new to the show, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Um, <laughs> or, uh, I guess, in these days, you uppercuts or, you know, whatever <laughs> violent verb they're using. <laughs> the bell button and Yeah, commit grievous harm upon the bell button. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh, uh, I will never ha stop having fun making mocking that shit. <laughs> Meanwhile, as the soul leaves my body, <laughs> hey, be glad that we you know we do this as um you know we don't have to make a living off of this show, mm -hmm. so you know we don't have to worry about how many views we get or whatever. You know, that's a nice thing. Like two mm -hmm. people. On the other hand, it would also be nice to make a living off this show. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm like, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, maybe one day, not today. Yeah. Anyway, um, coming up on the week ahead, um, Friday, January 10th, we will be, um, you know, doing our first European interview for the year. Uh, we'll be having Lukas Rosinski of Varsav. They're the developers of B Simulator. Yes, it is just B Simulator. You, you know, you are. Like the tin implies, a B, and you so do... like cement. Only no, 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 like you are an individual B. <laughs> uh, hmm. you know, I guess that's I, kind of an interesting thing to simulate, at least. Yeah, and coming up on the Sunday reviews, uh, we have uh, Attack of the Tanks for the Nintendo Switch, um, Volatile Triangle, and Kirchhoff's Revenge. So be sure to tune in um, for all of that, and of course we'll be having, you know, we'll still have the Final Fantasy XIV stuff uh, tomorrow, if I'm recalling correctly. So yes, tomorrow at around seven central. All right. So that is our schedule for the week upcoming, and until next time, I shall wish you good gaming. <laughs>